and not least of our speakers, has a remarkably dramatic story. No amount of introduction to this story will do it justice as she can. But as she speaks, I want you to remember the following line of poetry. When Robert Kennedy lost his brother, he would end many speeches with the following line when he was asked, how do you put up with the misery and the sadness and the brutishness of this world? And he would quote a line from Aeschylus, the Greek tragic poet, he read. I survived because I lived with the pain which falls drop by drop upon the heart until to the awful grace of God we attain wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ronnie Darwish. Thank you very much for inviting me. I want to thank you, the good people of Canada and America, for giving the opportunity to four Middle Eastern women to speak, debate, change ideas, and dissent. Something that was prohibited by my culture of origin, where it's a, it's a big taboo to speak, uh, to speak out with anything that's different from what you're being told. On 9-11, jihad has come to the West. It has come to America. And that is the day that I decided to speak out. I speak because I'm very concerned about Western culture. I speak out of respect for the 3,000 fellow Americans who died on that day. I also speak out of empathy for Israel, a country, a tiny country in the Middle in the Middle East that deserves our respect and not our hatred. I also speak because I love my people, the Arab people, the ordinary people of my culture is in desperate need for reformation. After 9-11, I heard a new definition of jihad. To the West, it was redefined as an inner struggle or self-analysis. I like that interpretation. But as an Arab child, as a person who lived for 30 years in the Middle East, I've never heard that interpretation in the middle. The, the meaning of jihad that we all grew up with is a religious holy war against non-believers for the sake of Allah. Jihad is ingrained in Muslim culture as the most honorable thing to aspire for. It is how we see the world, Muslim versus non-Muslim. It is our pride, our duty, and our right, our right to do against the infidel. Al-Azhar University, which is the oldest university in the Middle East, and an Islamic university, uh, until today, it teaches jihad as a series of war proclamations against Jews, Christians, and pagans. It is thought as a permanent war institution that targets whole groups of people who are living today. In some Arab schools, jihad is thought as taking an infidel's head. That has been literally happening when they decapitated and beheaded Daniel Plum and others. Attempting to reform jihad only in the eyes of the West is misleading. 
and will not solve the problem where it's desperately needed in the Middle East. I was born and raised as a Muslim in Cairo, Egypt, and in the Gaza Strip, a time when President Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt was committed to reunify the Arab world and destroy Israel. My father, in the 50s, headed the Egyptian military intelligence in Gaza and started the Fida'iyin operations, meaning armed resistance, against Israel under the orders of the Malabar Master. They made the Fida'iyin, made cross-border attacks daily into Israel and caused as much damage, destruction, and death. In response to the terror, one night Israel sent its commandos to our heavily guarded home in Gaza City. My father was not home that night. All the Israeli soldiers found were us women and children in the house. The Israeli soldiers left us unharmed. I was very grateful they did not kill us. Especially that the Fidayeen did kill Israeli civilians. After two years of intensive Fidayeen operation, my father was eventually killed in the first targeted assassination in Gaza in 1956. I was eight years old. In Nasser's famous speech to nationalize the Suez Canal, he hailed my father as a national hero, a Shaheed. President Nasser vowed on in that speech to, uh, that all of Egypt will take revenge from Israel, and no, he never mentioned the heavy toll of death and destruction brought upon Israel by the Fidaini, which he ordered. My siblings and I were lined up by uh, the Egyptian government officials who came to uh, pay condolences after my father was killed. And they asked, they asked us, which one of you kids will avenge your father's blood by killing Jews? We all looked, looked at each other, speechless. We were mourning. We didn't want to be burned by wanting to kill Jews. When the West Bank and Gaza were in Arab hands, see, Gaza at that time was under Egyptian control and the West Bank under Jordanian control. The infrastructure and economy were neglected, and the two regions were simply used as launching grounds of war or terror against Israel. They never built schools, hospitals, Arab, the oil-rich Arab countries in the Middle East neglected the Palestinians. They only rewarded them. Whoever wanted to be terrorism or against Israel were the ones who became prominent in the community, the ones who had jobs, the ones who wanted peace were called traitors, killed on the spot, or were unemployed. It has now become very convenient to blame, to blame today's worldwide Islamic terrorism on the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. That's the excuse that we always give. There is, there is Islamic terrorism because of, because of the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. But ladies and gentlemen, what about the terrorism that I witnessed as a child against Israel that happened before the occupation and before the 67 war against Israel. <laughs> Radical Muslims, even the ones who claim to be moderate, were silent after 9-11. They were not shouting, not in my religion's name, not in my name, not in my beloved the Quran, and not in the name of Islam. I haven't seen that from Muslims after 9-11. No Muslim group that ever demonstrated after every act of terrorism around the world and cried the way we see them, act when they are offensive. We have never seen any Muslim group defend the Afghani, poor Afghani man who converted out of Islam and was sentenced to death in Afghanistan. I want to see where are the moderate Muslims 
who were standing in front of the Afghani embassy in Canada and in America.